will not subscribe to your noisy, foul-mouthed, immature, out-of-focus deeds of dick, you dark knight of the round hole. Why do you always have to be such a fucking wank? I... I can't go back and slant you not subscribing, disturbing. <laughs> what a fucking muppet. Hi and welcome back to Miniature Dork Universe. So here on the left we have a Marmon Harrington CTLS and on the right we have a Vickers uh, Model 1936 Dutchman. Uh, they're for the Dutch East Indies, my project I'm doing for the Pacific. Um, so I did a black surface primer coat with the Vallejo primer just to give it a nice dark base coat. The finishes on both tanks had pretty dark tones, so that's why I use black. This is the Marmon Harrington. I got this off of eBay, 1100 scale. I can't remember the manufacturer, but it's a 3D print. And they've done a pretty good job. I was pretty happy with it. And then the Vickers tank is from Battlefield 3D. And that's also obviously a 3D print and it turned out quite well. So for the Dutch tank I mixed up a color called Legergroen. That's how the Dutch pronounce it. It basically means army green. Uh, yeah, and I kind of had to guess at it. I do have a swatch that I found on the internet, but you know, you got to take that with a grain of salt. And then I just lightened it up for a bit of modulation with some uh, deck tan. But we'll get into the colors a little bit later. So I'll begin by talking a bit about these KNIL tanks. And I'd like to say first that the colors are a little off in this picture. I think the, the green I put in behind them kind of threw out all of my color here. Um, the Vickers tank is definitely not that gray, but you'll get a chance to see what they look like, a more accurate representation later on when I have them on a white background. So the Vickers model 1936 Dutchman had a crew of two, maximum armor of a walloping 9 millimeters, um, armed with a powerful Vickers 303 machine gun, top speed of 46 kilometers per hour, about 43, or sorry, 73 were delivered to the KNIL. And again, I use that uh, Liga Rune Army Green color. And then we have on the right here the Marmon Harrington CTLS 4TAC. So there was two versions, the 4TAC and I think the 4TAY. And the difference was is one had the turret on the left and the driver on the right and the other had the reverse. And I think the reason for this was because this tank was supposed to be exported everywhere. So depending on what side of the road, you know, a particular country drove on, they could export the tank. But for some reason, the Dutch had both. <laughs> it's kind of weird. But the Marmon Harrington had a crew of two as well. Uh, its armor was 12.7 millimeters, but apparently the quality of the armor was kind of shitty. So actually the Vickers with nine millimeter armor was a bit tougher and the armament was two 30 cal m 1919 mgs top speed of 53 kilometers per hour so both tanks have a pretty good top speed for the day and the KNIL ordered 653 of these but only a few arrived to the dutch east indies before the japanese attacked and uh yes and i used tamia us olive drab for the color i looked into the colors so for the vickers um, I did read that it might have been kept in the British sort of bronze green color, so that's another option you can do. But it does seem that there was a, a you know, like a standard Dutch color. And s considering that most of their equipment was imported, <laughs> um, maybe they did repaint everything or maybe they left everything in the original color. I don't know. But uh, yeah, the, the Marmon Harringtons arrived later though, so... I'm guessing they retained their U.S. olive drab. And in photos, that olive drab looks very dark. Even though the Marmon Harrington was a slightly more modern tank than the Vickers, it was actually the worst <laughs> of the lot. And it might have been the worst tank of the Second War. Just about everything that could be wrong with it was. The, uh, the armor was a bit thicker, but it was kind of brittle and tended to shatter more. It was riveted like the Vickers tank, so there's no big deal there. 
Um, the engine was very unreliable, so even though it was a bit faster, it was more likely to break down. Um, yeah, the visibility for the crew was really poor in the Marmon Harrington, and it didn't have a, like a, a fume extractor. So when those machine guns are blazing away, the crew in there are about ready to pass out and die. Uh, apparently the vision blocks in the uh, vision ports were really bad too, so they would just take them out. So they had a slight bit of bulletproof protection, but of course once they're out, they didn't. So all you had to do to seriously damage a crew member is fire into the vision ports. So yeah, it was pretty terrible. The Vickers tanks were much more reliable. Um, so yeah. I kind of like that though. I mean, one of the things I like about this whole sort of era is that these tanks are kind of steampunk looking, you know, relics of the 30s that actually went to war. And the Japanese tanks weren't much better. I mean, they did have some better armed tanks for sure than the Dutch did. But, um, you know, it's, a, an ex it's an example where some of the Japanese equipment was superior to the Allies. Uh, that didn't last long, but definitely in the Dutch East Indies campaign that was the case. So here I'm spraying on the uh, the Dutch color and as you can see it's much more green than what I uh, showed in the picture or what you see here it looks pretty gray. So here's my Tamiya mix it's field gray and dark green and then I lightened it with deck tan. Um, so yeah the CTLS was painted with Tamiya olive green and right here I'm just doing some very basic modulation. I mixed in um, a bit of the uh, Tamiya dark yellow and I'm just using a piece of uh, it's one of those Vesda Art of Tactic cards that I cut down. It's sort of a plasticized paper and I just go around and just do some very basic mod modulation. They're fairly boxy, simplistic tanks, so uh, it's kind of nice to add some of the modulation to things like that to make them a bit more interesting. So here we are again, the XF62 olive drab, and then highlighted with FX60 dark yellow. And then with the highlights, I just take my brightest color that I used in the airbrush and paint the highest areas um, with with a brush just to get those high highlights and after I paint all the bolts and hatch covers and things with the high highlights I use the uh, X22 Tamiya Clear just to give it a gloss coat and then I apply the decals and use that Walther's Solve Set to get them to settle that works really well. If you know another kind that works really well, you can use that. But if you have some decal set and it's kind of crappy, try this out because it's really awesome. The decals I use for this came from I-94 Enterprises. Um, I put their website up there under the solve -a set setting solution picture. I find their decals are really nice. They don't really silver. Um, I find the Flames of War ones can silver if you don't cut away some of the carrier film. Uh, so they settle down really nicely. So yeah, I, I put those on, I hit them with a decal solution, and then when the I let it dry overnight, and then with a brush I paint more of the clear over the decals just to um, really seal them in. There's not a lot of reference on these KNIL tanks, so I jammed a triangle on the side here, but I don't think that happened. <laughs> I just liked it, but there did seem to be one here on the back. So I put that there, and I don't know what that number is. I have seen them with the Dutch flag on them, but I think they're from Suriname. Uh, okay, and here's the Vickers tank. There's a few more pictures of those, um, and I think they changed the markings slightly uh, around the time when the Japanese attacked. So, yeah, you'll see here I put one on the front. There's also one on the back of the turret. I don't know what that X is. Um, somewhere... In the references of Osprey, it says they have a, a one one point five centimeter QC marking, but it doesn't really elaborate what the hell that is. So I don't know. And I've seen some with a number three and these license plates. I'm going to put on it. It appears like they're painted on, 
but uh, I made mine more like license plates. Again, there's a bit of artistic license here, um, but they should look close enough to the genuine article. Once the decal's on, I put a wash on. I used these um, ammo acrylic washes again. So I used the dark wash, which is a dark brown for the whole tank pretty much, and then the black wash I use for the engine grills and things like that. And this is a mix of flow improver, so you can buy this acrylic flow improver, and you mix one part to 20 parts of water, so it goes a pretty long way, but it just improves the capillary action of the surface. So I just spray it over the entire tank and then start applying the wash, and it just helps it run into all the cracks and recesses better. Um, acrylic wash doesn't really flow as well as oils, so this will help it to get more of that flow like what you might get with oils. It's not still, it's not as good as oils, but it's getting pretty close. Um, and yeah, later I might put on some other washes for streaks and things like that. And I'll also use a lighter, like a dust wash for the tracks, just so it looks like the tracks might have been muddy and then the mud dries off and just remains in the the cracks and the recesses. That's usually how I do it. And I could make them more muddy. These tanks were in the monsoon season, but I, I feel like I just want to keep them a bit more simple and basic. Here I'll use this Citadel wash on the bedrolls. I find it's a little less extreme than the ammo washes in terms of being contrasty. So I've watered down the wash a bit. This is the dark wash, so I'm going to put this everywhere pretty much except for the the grills over the engine but around all the bolts and the panel recesses I'll just use this dark wash and I've sprayed it with that uh, flow improver so you can see how well it helps that wash to sink in and I'm kind of doing like a a pin wash and the thing about this wash too is you can after you know you got about 15 minutes if you find that there's too much excess or something you can just water it down and it'll reactivate and you can push it off of areas if there's too much it's almost kind of like uh, watercolor maybe I don't know exactly what it is so yeah I'm just gonna go around all the tanks with this and give it the basic dark coat and then um, put the black in around the engine grills are Before I do a matte varnish, I'm going to glue the license plates on. So here I'll show you how I do things like that because it can be kind of tricky. Um, so the, this super glue is on the top of this old film canister and I'm going to use a dental pick to apply it to the tank. Because if you apply it to the license plate and it falls or something, you're going to glue it to something. So when I'm doing things like this or gluing stowage on or something, I always make sure that I put the glue on the tank and not the piece that I'm going to glue on because they're very small and they're very squirrely and here I'm just using blue tack I've made a little applicator with a blue tack and that gives me a lot of control I can just position it and then I'll use the other end of the dental pick to hold it in place sorry there and then once it's done I move the blue tack and it was still wet enough that I could sort of you know, nudge it over to the side a little bit, and there it is. Um, so that was fairly painless, but believe me, <laughs> these kinds of things can be very painful. So this is the way you avoid a lot of bad language and maybe punching some inanimate objects and sustaining an injury or a drug habit. I should mention too that I made those license plates in a page layout program, kind of like I do my labels for my basing. Um, yeah, so it's easy enough to make your own like Wehrmacht license plates or things like this. And again, this wasn't a plate, it was painted on, but I made it as a plate. What can you do? That's what I got. So the one on the back actually was on a license plate type thing. And then we're going to hit it with a coat of matte varnish and a course I like that AK ultra matte does a good job and then we'll get on to the dry brushing so I usually put some of this golden retarder into my paint because it makes it so that the paint doesn't 
You want a dry brush, meaning that the brush doesn't have a lot of paint on it, but you don't want the paint to dry on your brush. So the acrylic retardant will keep the paint from drying prematurely. So uh, it really makes your dry brushing turn out a lot nicer. So for the Vickers tank, I use the Vallejo Green Gray for my dry brush. Really brought that detail out. And then for the CTLS, I use Brown Violet and I mix in some Middle Stone. Probably kind of like one part Brown Violet to two parts Middle Stone. I, I make it quite light, but use your own judgment. Don't go overboard and it should turn out pretty nice. So now we'll show some of the other paint colors that I used to paint these. The tarps were painted with U.S. Field Drab as sort of the base color. And then the leather straps I did flat brown. They don't need to be leather straps, whatever color you want. And then for the tarp highlights I mixed khaki in with the U.S. Field Drab. And then for the flat brown I mixed in orange brown just for the highlights. Then the M1919 machine guns and the tires on the tanks, uh, black, gray, and the tracks I mix black, gray, and chocolate brown. The fire extinguisher on the Vickers tank, I use this Vallejo metal color. It says it's an airbrush color, but it paints really well with a brush too. I find some of the metallics are thick and gooey and kind of have a crappy finish, but this one comes on nice and smooth, so that's pretty good. Um, exhaust pipes, I start with a base of just chocolate brown. And then for my first rusty sort of tone, I use red leather. And then I'll mix yellow in to lighten that up. And that usually turns out quite good. Um, okay, so they put a like a asbestos tape around a portion of the exhaust on the Vicker tank, the front portion by the number three. And I use German camouflage beige and then a lighter striping of stone gray just to show like the wrapped tape effect. It was put there so that people didn't get burnt on the exhaust. And then for all of the uh, bright metal areas on the tracks and along the tops of the M1919 machine guns, I just use a 2B pencil. I don't usually use a lot of pastels or, or pigments, but in this case I did. I just wanted to put kind of a, a dusty effect in behind the wheels where I'm not going to touch with my hands. You don't even need to seal it down if you put it in areas where you're not going to touch it. Um, so yeah, I just use actual pastels and grind them down and just use a paintbrush like this to apply them. Uh, before that, I also stippled on some of this uh, acrylic craft paint. I use this stuff for all of my sort of groundwork. And so then I transfer that up onto my tanks. And then I put some photo etched leaves and palm fronds on. I had a picture like this. This is a Vickers tank destroyed. Um, I sort of wanted the effect of maybe a shitty camouflage job by inexperienced crew or maybe the remnants of a better camouflage job that was just mostly taken off before going into combat. These things didn't have very good uh, visibility for the crew, so you really wouldn't want to hamper it any further. And then this is ET model is where I got this leaves and this was Voyager model, the palm fronds. They were for 172 scale. So the leaves were given a dark, dark brown primer and the palm fronds were given a white primer. And then the rest I did with a paintbrush. So all the green leafy stuff, I used German camouflage bright green for the base green. And then I just mixed in yellow a couple times. I did a couple little layers of highlight. And then for the actual branches that were pa uh, spray painted dark brown, I just used flat earth and just, you know, put, put in some highlights, but not everywhere, just to make it stand out. After I'm done painting in all the foliage, I go back with some of the uh, ultra matte varnish. The areas where I crazy glue the foliage to the tanks has a sort of glossy little blob. Um, that remains from the crazy glue process. So that matte varnish pretty much makes the crazy glue disappear, which is nice. And that pretty much does it. So here we have our finished tanks. And of course, at the end, I'm going to show stills of what they look like. And the colors are going to 
be better represented, I think, with the stills because this green background is making, especially the Vickers tank, it's kind of making it look a little more gray than I think it really is. Um, yeah, I still haven't mastered my cameras and things yet. <laughs> Bear with me. It, although I haven't figured it out yet, so maybe I'll never figure it out. But anyway, thank you for watching and stay tuned for more miniature dork adventures and uh yeah until then happy modeling and fume inhaling I'm your fucking enemy! Yeah, yeah.